tonight, a controversial land use code in the city has been put to rest. And are students with invisible disabilities represented on campus? Our chief anchors have the report. We're living in the digital age, but how does technology affect student learning? With the attention issues that electronics cause, um, we're seeing more and more people reporting they feel like they have a short attention span, and that's true for students as well. Well, in Fort Collins means university-wide events. See what took place this week in Ram Country. All that and more on CTV starting now. Good evening. I'm Bailey Borkowski. And I'm Tate Paisley. Thank you for joining us tonight. U plus two is no more in Fort Collins. Governor Jared Polis signed a House bill on Monday prohibiting many residential occupancy limits. Here in Fort Collins, U plus two prevents more than three unrelated people from living in the same home. Now, starting in July, this act will be overturned. During his speech on the steps of the Capitol, Pola said this bill will help Coloradoans live in the communities they choose. It's a crime going on behind closed doors of a local church for decades. Former Fort Collins youth pastor Hippolito Gomez Perdomo has been arrested for allegedly sexually assaulting children going back 30 years. During the 2023 investigation, multiple witnesses came forward stating that Gomez Perdomo sexually abused them as young girls. 65-year-old Gomez Perdomo was arrested on five counts of sexual assault on a child in a position of trust. He's booked in Larimer County Jail on a $200,000 bond. The Sheriff's Office believes there may be more victims. If anyone has information, they are encouraged to contact Investigator Travis Fisher at 970-498-5585. A Fort Collins man was found dead in a ditch last Friday. CTV News Father Director and reporter Robbie Patlett is on the scene where the body was found. Fill us in, Robbie. I'm Robbie Patlett for CTV Channel 11. Back to you guys. Having some technical difficulties. Thank you, Robbie. Unfortunately, we're having some technical difficulties, but you can watch the full story on our YouTube channel at CTV 11. Anyone who has not yet spoken to law enforcement is encouraged to call Investigator Marcus Simlane at 970-498-5515. Former Pooter School District bus attendant involved in more than 160 charges receives the maximum sentence. Tyler Zanella will now serve 12 and a half years in jail for assault and abuse of children with disabilities. The incident in question took place in spring of 2023, involving at least 11 children. Zanella was arrested after the school reviewed surveillance of him hitting a nonverbal child. Further investigation found most children involved are on the autism spectrum. After a year waiting for the trial, Judge McDonald imposed the maximum sentence. Brian Kingsley issued a statement expressing they have taken measures to ensure the safety of students. Good evening Rams, I'm Elise Gerke here to bring you tonight's weather forecast. Currently in Fort Collins it is 46 degrees outside, the sunset at 7.43 p.m. and the humidity is at 5%. There's nothing like snow in the middle of April. Fort Collins got a light dusting of snow last night and briefly this morning, making for an extremely gray day. I took a quick trip to Horsetooth Reservoir to take in the beautiful scenery and feel the mountain air. Hopefully we'll see spring in full effect soon. Heading into our overnight lows, Fort Collins is gonna sit at 36 degrees tonight, Denver at 35, Colorado Springs at 34, and Pueblo at 39. Heading over to the Eastern Plains, it's a little bit warmer than usual tonight, with Sterling and Burlington at 36, Lamone at 30, and Lamar also at 36. Over on the Western Slopes, we have Craig at 39, Grand Junction at 54 degrees, Vail at 35, and Gunnison and Tellur Telluride at 38 degrees. 
tomorrow in Fort Collins, we'll see some, uh, we'll see a little bit of a warmer weather. Um, the high is going to be 52 and the low is going to be 32 with the sun setting one minute later at 7.44 p.m. With temperatures reaching up to 70 degrees by Wednesday, there is a thousand percent chance the little snow we got will vanish. It is going to be a whopping 80 degrees and mostly sunny. This has to be the most exciting five day forecast I've seen in this position that I started three months ago. After the break, students with invisible disabilities speak out on the effects and technology. We will be right back. After two years? You're gonna be kidding me! Okay, okay, no, Robbie! Seriously, Seriously, do you have anything you can use against the dragon? I can do a fireball, that'll do a lot of damage. Yeah, fireball. to all of us! Well, I, 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 We're in a four foot group! I'm sorry, what else do you want me to oh do? I can oh, hey, okay, 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 okay. Hold on, hold on. Alright. Wizard, what do you do? Welcome back from the break. I'm Kate Sherman. I'm Bella Walzer. And I'm JJ McKinney. According to the CDC, up to one in four adults in the United States have some sort of disability. One in four of these adults do not have the usual health care provider or have an unmount health care need because of cost. With disabilities affecting such a large population of students, Colorado State recognizes that not everyone has access to general accommodations and health care needs. So, how does CSU work with the Student Disability Center to help accommodate students? And today, I am standing outside of the Student Disability Center located inside of the LSC, where I'll be speaking with Sammy Trout, an ASCSU senator who helps advocate for students with disabilities here at CSU. So, first off, I just want to have you tell me a little bit about what your experience with the SDC has been as a person with an invisible disability. My experience within the SDC has primarily been advocating with the SDC um, within the student government here at ASCSU, um, in which I serve as a center for the SDC. I also serve as the co-founder and chair of the Accessibility Caucus within ASCSU, works to bring more of a community within for disabled students. And what have you heard about others' experiences within the SDC? I've heard really good things for the most part. I know there were issues in years previous about having not enough accommodation specialist staff members, which is which made getting accommodations within the SDC really difficult. You know, you have to wait for you know there to be room in the schedule, and sometimes they're like, "Sorry, we just can't get to you right now." I know that has improved since they've hired on more staff members, and so it has been going really better. Um, but I know for a long time it was really difficult for students. And what do you think that the SDC does well? I think the SDC does really well in getting the right accommodations for students um, and for really taking their time with each accommodation and looking at the, the needs of the student and advocating for those students. Personally, what is the most frustrating thing for you living with a disability? I think the most frustrating thing for me is I, unlike many other students with disabilities, I have to publicly announce that if I have any, um, which can be a really icky spot to be in. I know a lot of students feel like they can't be in spaces like um, disability advocacy because they don't look disabled. Just by looking at me, you wouldn't know I am, you know, I have autism. You wouldn't know I suffer tinnitus and hearing deficiency. You know, you wouldn't know that just by looking at me. Countering that, what's one positive about living with a disability? It's made a lot of things in my personal life make a lot of sense. Um, and has given, I know it's not the same for a lot of people, but it's given me a sense of community and it's given me a sense of better understanding of who I am as a person. Do you have anything else that you want to add or do you think that's important? CSU as a whole can do better in advocating for its students. Um, I know the biggest issue that I hear is, well, the SDC gave me this accommodation, but my professors are not upholding that accommodation. And so I think there's a lot of educating that needs to happen for faculty and professors and folks in that realm of like, you, it, this is not something you can just ignore. I think it's really important that CSU be the leader and trailblazer that it can be in advocating for students with disabilities and making this campus more accessible. It has the funding to do it, it just needs to, you know, fo you know clock in and, and, and do it. Now Trout is just one of many who have to live with invisible disabilities on a daily basis. 
while Trout may have some sway within student government, not all students have those resources. Today, I wanted to talk to CSU students about their own personal experience with the Student Disability Center. Growing up with ADHD, um, school's never really been my strong suit. Always, um, I don't know, struggled with routine and just, I don't know, just learning the way that normal students are supposed to learn. I was diagnosed with ADHD um, pretty late in my life, considering how often people are diagnosed at a much younger age. And I kind of went to the SDC not really knowing what I was doing or what accommodations really looked like. And I went like, what can I have for a meeting? And they were like, well, you can have the ones we give to everyone. And I was like, what if that's not good enough? And they were like, oh, prove, prove that you have ADHD. And I said, okay, here are my medical records. And they never did anything with it after that. And that's where I think some of the accommodations they have kind of, I mean, they do what they can, and I don't know, I guess, what could be improved in that sense, but I, I definitely think there's a lot of room for growth in like the types of accommodations. You know, I'm not the only person on campus with a disability um, or requesting help or information, but I feel like they're very detached, and I've been kind of like passed around different accommodation specialists. And, and it's hard, and I understand where the teachers, like, they're not, it's hard to expect them to, you know, understand every person's unique, you know, disability. And like, for me, it's ADHD, but it's, that's a huge blanket. I mean, people can have ADHD and be totally differently affected than me. Um, and so I could kind of just go through the rest of my college experience, like self-medicating or like self-advocating in the ways that I could that were outside of the, like, straight designation. And that really just involved a lot of communication between myself and my professors and just anybody who is really willing or able to give me accommodations kind of outside the normal way you would do it. It's like as a student you know just kind of advocate for yourself and talk to teachers about what you need they're there to help a majority of them are and so that's where there's some common ground and where they can kind of understand. Now that we have gotten multiple viewpoints about the different experiences CSU students go through just to find accommodation that leads us to the big question. If you can't find any way to get your disability accommodated, what do you do? According to research done by Forbes magazine and the National Health Institute, over 42 million people in the U.S. alone suffer from some type of severe disability, with 96% of those being unseen. Now, the SDC does provide accommodations for students in need of support, including test accommodations, textbook accessibility, and emotional support animals. But with so many students in need of support, it could be really hard to reach all of them in a timely manner. That's where CSU professor of computer science, Logan Seaboat, comes in with some ideas about how to help. Can you tell us a bit about your process for ensuring that the courses are accommodated for students on campus? Yep, so one of the big things I focus on is standardizing accommodations across all factors. Um, there's multiple studies that show that when you make something um, accessible, it generally is better for everyone. Um, more accessible content in almost every case is better for most people. I have a standardized format of um, universal accommodation for my CT301 course, for example. All assignments have their initial due date, and then they have a one-week late period where students can resubmit. Um, and I built that off of the SDC standardized, you know, at most one week extension. So I made sure that we're meeting the same boundaries that they require. How have you noticed the accommodations that you provided for students are helping them or affecting the work? For the students who really need it, it's been very helpful. I mean, I have a lot of students who are able to get their initial assignments in. Maybe they get like a 50% on the initial assignment. They're then able to look at what they did wrong, you know, fix it up, get feedback and understand why they got the code wrong and then they're able to submit it again and be able to get full points in most cases. Could we circle back and state why it's important for oh, students to be accommodated? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for one, you know, there's always issues with life. I mean, things happen. Life can just hit you out of nowhere. I mean, a sudden illness, a random injury, you know, things like that. And even in those cases, I tend to make additional accommodations with, you know, proper documentation. As long as I get the letter, I will bend over backwards to do whatever needs to be done to make sure that you can get things done on time. Regardless of if you have, you know, something that's visible or not visible, something mental or internal, like it doesn't matter. You need these resources to get the help you need. But I really do actually like the SCC. I mean, they're really helpful, but I know a lot of it is oftentimes just communication. We need to really hold ourselves to a higher standard on accessibility and accommodations. 
a lot of people could do better and that we need to not, Which is you know, ignore it. It shouldn't be on the students to have to do. I feel like as faculty, we owe it to the students to make things more accommodable. Now with the amount of people's disabilities that are affected, the Student Disability Center tries their best to accommodate for all students. We spoke with Joe Tenner, the Assistant Director for Access and Accommodations at the SDC. In the fall, our office did experience um, some backup um, for employment wait times due to an unexpected um, increase in students working with us. The university responded by providing us additional staffing to help meet the need and the demand. And so this semester, now that we are fully staffed, we've not had um, extended wait times for appointments. We're getting students in in usually just a couple of days. We also are continuing to work on our processes internally to make them as efficient as possible. And so we've made some changes of offering students the ability to um, not only have an appointment, but prior to their appointment, submit some information and documentation in hopes of getting accommodations approved um, before their appointment to help speed that process up. Additionally, we continue to work with our campus partners, um, so advocating to, you know, to faculty to say, like, you know, how do you make your class more inclusive and universally designed so that maybe accommodations aren't formally needed because you've built a class structure that is just inclusive from the get-go. Please know that we are here to support you. We want you to come to come back and come meet with us, come talk to us. Our wait times are now very low. We're seeing students within just a couple of days. And so please don't hesitate to come back to us. We want you here. We want you to be on campus and we want to support you in the ways that we can. That wraps up our investigative report. Now let's head over to Gabrielle for more on technology's impact in the classroom. Thanks, JJ. Social media has a widespread effect on how we communicate with others, replacing a lot of face-to-face -face interactions with digital means of connecting with people. This has greatly impacted CSU students, especially in classrooms where most have reverted to their cell phones instead of talking amongst their peers. Professor Patrick Mahoney and student Samantha Nordstrom share their insights on this issue. It's, you know, like one button away or whatever, click of a button and you're sending a message, but the actual depth of those connections is not going to be as deep as it would if it were in like form a relationship that was like more of a in-person connection. You know, you're not meeting them in person. You're not going to be able to read their, their energy or their attitude or like certain things like or just like the way they carry themselves. Technology has a significant impact on the ways we interact with others, especially those who we do not have a strong connection with. From sociologist Dr. Pat Mahoney's perspective, technology has greatly altered human behaviors. It's very easy to walk away right, from an interaction in the digital world if I feel uncomfortable or if I disagree. So I can kind of hunker down in my own position without A, being challenged, or at least trying to understand and come to some mutual, you know, agreement and we can become overburdened right and feel a sense of disconnectedness a sense of powerlessness a sense of lack of agency we can become very depressed right demoralized and those are really really powerful emotions to try to overcome what i've noticed over the years is that students are far less inclined to come to me face to face there's great promise with this technology but we should have a right to demand that it be used and directed in particular ways. Mm -hmm. According to Dr. Mahoney, technology can be an inhibitor of human flourishing if used incorrectly, but technology can be a source of good such as a larger web of human connections and knowledge if utilized correctly. Technology can inhibit students from making quality connections with their professors and peers. Based off of these professors' insights, one suggestion is students putting their phones away whenever possible, and professors could implement a no-phone policy in the classroom to better connect with the real world. This is Gabrielle Hibbets reporting for CTV Channel 11. Thanks, Gabrielle. While electronics are heavily used in classrooms, some are concerned that using an iPad or computer in class takes away from the quality of student learning. Many students use computers or iPads in class to take notes, but how distracting is it and does it affect students' ability to learn? A study done by Harvard found that students who use electronics in class tend to get distracted, resulting in a lower overall grade. A local therapist shares what she notices about electronics affecting students. 
with the attention issues that electronics cause, um, we're seeing more and more people reporting they feel like they have a short attention span, and that's true for students as well. They're having a hard time not only attending to their tasks and schoolwork, but then in classes as well, it's really hard to listen to a professor speak for long periods of time. They're losing that concentration, and so the retention of information just isn't there. The quality of work is suffering, and then we'll see obvious impacts on grades because of that. Students across campus share their thoughts on using a pen and paper versus electronics. I'm a big pen and paper kind of person. I use like colored pens sometimes. I'm really feeling it. Um, I just feel like it helps me retain information better, but it's definitely a little like easier to use a computer. Personally, I have an iPad and a little like stylus and I think it's really fun doing it electronically because it's easy and it's all stored on one device instead of having a whole bunch of paper. It really helps writing it down no matter what, even if that's like on an iPad. By using whichever learning strategies that work best for them, students have the opportunity to thrive academically. I'm Bailey Borkowski from CTV Channel 11. Electronics are not disappearing anytime soon, and with new innovations being introduced daily, finding a balance between the virtual world and reality may be a helpful tool. That's right, Bailey. Virtual reality is rapidly advancing, and as technology evolves, questions arise about its impact on mental well-being. Good evening, Rams. My name is Tate Paisley from CTV. Tonight, we delve into the ever-advancing world of virtual reality, a technology that not only changes the way we play games, but also how we perceive reality. I think we're sort of seeing a, a, a gradual transition to trying to make VR more uh, approachable to you know, the everyday user. So I think we're starting to see this slow transition to that more mass market ad adapt uh, adaptability. With big companies like Apple beginning to develop VR technologies, many people wonder whether this kind of technology advancement could begin to damage our already screen-obsessed minds. I think it can be detaching from those around you, especially if it's like, I don't know, just like, disappearing in your, your room for hours to, to end up playing games and stuff like that and just being entirely immersed in this, at least with other games and stuff like that that can be social pursuits. If life is difficult, I think it can be easy to sort of attempt to leave that in certain ways and I think it's easy to get that through virtual, rea vir virtual realities, that is leaving uh, sort of constructive reality and entering one that you want more so. So I think that naturally facilitates addiction. Meta, um, you know, they, they just recently started pushing uh, VR headset use for 10 year olds. There's research that says, you know, using VR headsets at, the, at those younger ages, that's when you could potentially start to see issues. With recent advancements, such as the Apple Vision Pro providing real world VR usage, only time will tell what this means for the future of virtual reality and its effects on our already tech-filled lives. With VR set to revolutionize industries, the conversation about its effects is on the rise more than ever before. CSU hosted one of its biggest events of the year on Sunday, the annual drag show. This year's theme, it's giving Mother Earth. Nearly 1,000 people sat in the LSC's Grand Ballroom to witness the drag queens and kings show off their talents. While attendance was free, attendees were encouraged throughout the show to donate money in support of LGBTQIA scholarships. Student Enoch Mananti spoke about the importance of these scholarships for CSU students inspiring people to pursue their own dreams as well as since it's a fundraising event for a scholarship making sure other lgbtq plus youth have access to funds that they might not they might need in case they can't attend college otherwise headlining the event was mirage a contestant on season 16 of rupaul's drag race performing alongside her were many students and other local performers the head of the CSU Drag House of Ovis, King Casa, had this to say about the event. But I think it's incredible that CSU students have the opportunity to express themselves like this and to be seen like this and to be celebrated like this. This week, the CSU Pride Resource Center announced that they had reached their fundraising goal of $5,000. <laughs> Thank you. 
More information about how to support Pride at CSU can be found at prideresourcecenter.colostate.edu. This is Chigoze Ozor reporting for CTV Channel 11. Stick around and see how women's sports continue to inspire the CSU community after the break. Awkward. I'm the awkward silence. You try to avoid me, then there I am again. But an awkward silence can be a great thing. Like Kelly here is about to demonstrate. You haven't really been yourself lately. Are you okay? Find out how you can help a friend with their mental health at SeizeTheAwkward.org. Welcome back from the break. I'm Ruby Kayser. The CSU women's golf team is having a historical year. I sat down with fifth year senior Andrea Berg's daughter to hear about the record breaking season. Andrea Berg's daughter is an international student from Sweden on the CSU women's golf team. I mean, coming as an international here was definitely not easy. Just culture shocks, food wise, also being away from family, friends for that long. It was Freshman year was not like super easy, but then um, since we have such a small team, you kind of get along pretty quick, you get friends in the team, you feel more welcome, you just have a little home away from home. CSU Women's Golf has made history, winning three tournament titles this season. I think that everyone just like stepped up, put in like some extra work and extra motivation, and that's just a lot. The culture is really good in the team, like we're all very close friends, we hang out a lot and outside of practice and tournaments and golf. Berg's daughter herself has tied the program record, winning two individual titles. I just go into every tournament feeling like I can win every tournament, which I haven't had that feeling in a long time. It's definitely like some confidence, like going into every tournament feeling feeling good about myself, but also for sure some pressure, like having that on my back. I just don't want to like ruin that kind of. The Rams are currently competing in the Mountain West Conference Championships. When asked about it last week, Berg's daughter had big goals for her team. I feel like we go into Mountain West very confident, knowing that we're there to compete for a championship. And we all want to win, like they've been talking about it all year. Like, because if you win, you hop in like a poppy's pond around the 18th green. We all just have the same goal. We really want to win. And individually, like, I really want to win too. So. The women finished up the Mountain West Championship Tournament today in Rancho Mirage, California. They finished at third place and the top performers were Andrea Bergsdotter who finished at fifth place. This is Ruby Kayser and CTV Channel 11. Women's sports are making major headlines and inspiring girls across the world. From Caitlin Clark to Becky Hammond, we all have someone who inspires us, even here on campus. While there are many inspirational women, students have told me just three of the inspiring women on campus. Being on campus every day, students are inspired by many. Focusing on inspiring women on campus, one of them would be McKenna Hofschild, point guard from the women's basketball team. Despite being an amazing player, McKenna has had tougher times within her long years of playing basketball. I think the most challenging moment or time I've had in basketball was my freshman year at Seton Hall but it was just it was kind of one of those things where I, I fell out of love with basketball and, um, and then after that season I transferred here to CSU and I've been here four years and it's been amazing and I'm very grateful that I stuck with it. While many individuals have only looked up to athletes some have had teachers or advisors they are inspired by while being here at CSU. And then I've literally been a part of CSU or this department or Warner College for um, more than 30 years now. So, wow, it's just an amazing gift to hear that. Um, I truly love what I do. Both really stoked and um, kind of abashed. And I think that's one of my favorite things about being in the position that I am is knowing that I get to impact and inspire a lot of people. and. I don't really take that lightly, so I try and be a good example, and hopefully I can, if I can make a difference in one person's life, that's good with me. 
Each individual has a piece of advice that they would want to share. Learn to believe yourself through a crisis. But take those risks that you're not sure if you should do it, try it. Find something that you love. It doesn't have to be basketball. It can be any sport. It can be any hobby, anything you want. Don't stop working for it. Uh, chase your dreams and, and don't let anyone tell you that you can't. These are three of the many inspiring women on campus at CSU. Athletes, professors, and advisors, which goes to show how strong the community truly is. And there is no better day to show community pride than April 18th. That's right, Karma. Today is I Love CSU Day. Students and faculty took to the plaza to celebrate the Ramley. Go Rams! Go Rams! <laughs> I love CSU because it's a great community. The campus is beautiful. There's so many great clubs and activities to get into, and I've just really enjoyed my time here. April 18th marks I Love CSU Day here on campus. I had the opportunity to talk with some Rams about their thoughts and opinions on what makes CSU different from other institutions. The people that I've met here that have made CSU so special to me, because I personally don't care where I'm at as long as I got the right people around me, and I found that at CSU. Take advantage of everything you can. Like it's super easy to be like, oh, you know, I'm too good for this club, or I'm too good for tutoring, or I'm too good for you know yada yada. It's like you're only here for four years. It goes by really fast. Say yes to everything. Go beyond your comfort zone. Everyone at CSU is always there to help you out. Trying new, really pushing your comfort zone is what you shouldn't, or what you should do coming in. Rams wore green and gold for I Love CSU Day, and celebrated by playing trivia grabbing a cold beer at the Ramskeller. I also had the chance to get myself an I Love CSU Day specialty coffee. That's pretty good. CSU Day allows us the opportunity to recognize what makes CSU and the Rams here unique. At least at CSU, it's a, a judge-free, stress-free zone, at least in all the places I've tried. So if you're invited to something, might as well say yes. It, it sounds cliche, but it's like a lot of, like a family around here. People are people are here for you. Last year, Governor Jared Polis even made April 18th officially I Love CSU Day. As it draws to a close, students and faculty conclude a day dedicated to celebrating green and gold. That is all the news we have for you tonight. Make sure to tune in to the next episode of CTV Sports on Tuesday. We'll see you then.